Hey you, yeah, you right there. Why don't you hit like and subscribe? And don't forget to hit that bell icon to receive notifications every time I release a new video. Thanks for your support and I'll see you in the lab. All right, let's talk about the female reproductive system. Um, I have two models out today and I'm gonna go through our term list. And um, the reason why I have two is because I think certain models show the terminology better than the other. And also, as my students know, I like to show as many different examples of these structures as possible because I think it helps us get a better overall view uh, and understanding of what we're looking at. So let's start off by looking at the vulva. And the vulva is going to be the general term for the um, external genitalia. You'll also see the term pudendum, and that is mainly in reference to a female's body. And so the first thing we have is the mons pubis. And the mons pubis is going to be this area right here. It's in the pubic region, and it also contains the subcutaneous tissue. The mons pubis is the area where pubic hair starts to grow during uh, puberty. Then we have two folds of tissue. Uh, we have the labia majora and the labia minora. Those are the plural terms. And since we have mid-sagittal views here, um, we need to remember that we're only looking at one half of the body. So this is anterior and this is posterior. So we're looking at the right half of the female's body. So the two folds of tissue um, in the singular term would be labium magus. That is going to be this right here. And on this model, it's represented by number 12. So that would be the right labium magus. And over here, also the right labium magus. Something that's interesting with the reproductive system is that males and females have um, structures called homologs. That root word homo means same. And what we see is that in uh, development in utero, we will have tissues that form from the same developmental structures, um, which, are, which are called primordia. But then by about the seventh week of pregnancy, those tissues will differentiate into specific looking structures, depending on if you're male or female. So uh, for example, the labium magus, that is the homologue for the scrotum in the male. So that tissue, if you're a male, that turns into the scrotum. If you're a female, that turns into the labia majus or the labia majora, if you're thinking about the pair of terms. And then inward to that, we have the labium minus, which is singular for labia minora. So this would technically be the right labia minus. Over here, the right labia minus is number 11. And the labia minora are actually going to be analogous with the body of the penis. So really kind of interesting to think about what happens as we develop in utero. Now the genotypic sex, meaning your chromosomes, that is determined at fertilization. So your biological sex happens at the moment of conception, but we kind of look physically similar until that seventh week of pregnancy. And that's when you kind of see things starting to differentiate. Next, we have the clitoris, and that is going to be this structure right here. On this model, it is number 13. That is a homologue to the glans penis of the male. And actually the prepuce, so remember from our last video, the uh, prepuce is the foreskin. And so um, part of the external fold of that for the female reproductive system comes from that labia minora, and that kind of makes sense when you see how these are situated right here. 
So the clitoris being a homologue to the glans penis and then the labia minora being a part of the uh, prepuce or the homologue to the prepuce and the body of the penis. And then we have this space called the vestibule. And the vestibule is going to be this area right here. And it describes the area that encloses two openings. So just a quick review, remember in females, we have three openings that correspond to three different organ systems. From anterior to posterior, we have the urinary system because that is the urinary bladder and the urethra, the reproductive system because this is the uterus and that's the vagina, and then the digestive system because here we have part of the uh, colon, rectum, anus. So urinary, reproductive, digestive. And the vestibule is going to describe the area kind of in the same region as the uh, labia minora that encloses the openings to the external urethral orifice and the vaginal orifice. So in this model, the vestibule is going to enclose the area of the external urethral orifice and the vaginal orifice. Now the vagina is going to describe a passageway. And sometimes I think before you get to an anatomy class, you kind of hear folks refer to all of this down here as the vagina, but technically the vagina is just this canal right here. So on uh, this model, it's number nine and my finger is over that, that passageway right there. I had just shown you the vaginal orifice and that's the um, opening to the external environment. There is uh, a transparent tissue in some females. Typically this tissue is ruptured during intercourse the first time and that's called the hymen. And the hymen will partially cover the opening of the uh, vagina, the, the vaginal canal right here. It isn't anything that you would see on the model here, but that is the uh, general area. And then as we move superiorly, we'll see these um, spaces, okay? And those spaces that kind of come upwards like that, those are referred to as fornices. And fornices is plural for the singular term fornix. So on this model right here, it's number 14. And you see how that comes up like that? A fornix is something that um, for my students, we actually saw this in AMP one in the brain because there's a fornix in the brain. And a fornix just describes an arch shape. And that is at the superior portion of the vagina and it's created by this structure right here. So uh, on this model, it's the number six. And I know it's listed twice, but really this is just the same thing. And that is the cervix. The cervix will pr protrude into the superior vagina and it creates these spaces over there. So now let's look at a coronal view of the uterus and the uterine tubes in the ovary. What we just saw was a mid-sagittal view and I like this view much better for explaining these next terms. So here we have the superior vagina, this is the cervix and there you see the uh, fornices right there. And I like to describe the cervix as kind of being the entryway into the uterus. The uterus is going to have three major layers. We will have the perimetrium, so think peri, kind of the outside, and that's the outermost layer. Then in the middle, we have the thick middle layer called the myometrium. That is a word pattern we've seen before in the heart chapter. And then the innermost layer is the endometrium. On this model, we're only showing one ovary here. And um, the ovary is going to be attached to the uterus via the ovarian ligament. So the ovarian ligament is going to attach the ovary to the uterus. Near the ovary, we have this arm-like structure 
called the uterine tube. You may have also seen the term fallopian tube, um, but the uterine tube is going to have some different structures here. There's a part, um, th or this part right here, and this model's a little bit um, deceptive in the sense that it makes it look like everything is directly connected, and it is not. So this part right here, I, I like to liken this to a hand. The hand or the palmar aspect of the hand, that is called the infundibulum. And then we're going to have these finger-like projections coming off of the infundibulum. They're really a part of the infundibulum. But those finger-like finger -like projections are called the fimbriae. And the fimbriae are actually going to hover around the ovary. Because remember, approximately once a month, one of the ovaries will eject a secondary oocyte, or we call that ovulation. And so during ovulation, that infundibulum is going to kind of hover over the ovary, and those fimbriae will kind of have this peristaltic movement to kind of draw that oocyte into the tube. So when that oocyte goes in, we go past the infundibulum, and then this portion right here is called the ampulla. And we have seen that term ampulla several times. It refers to a cup shape or like a bulging shape. And the ampulla is one of the most common areas where fertilization of an egg by a sperm would occur. Beyond that, we have an area of the uterine tube called the uh, isthmus. And that isthmus is going to then connect to the uterus. And then lastly, we will have the mammary gland, which is commonly known as the breast. And inside the breast, we will have these lobes, and the lobes are what produce breast milk. From those lobes, we will have these little passageways called lactiferous ducts. And those lactiferous ducts will uh, come to these little open areas called the lactiferous sinuses. So recall that a sinus is kind of an open space, and so we have these little open spaces here. And these lactiferous sinuses um, are where milk, uh, breast milk, is stored uh, before a feeding. Those will then connect to the outside of the woman's body at the nipple. So the nipple will have these um, uh, passageways which connect to these lactiferous sinuses. On the outside, so just this portion right here is the nipple, and then this pigmented area surrounding the nipple is called the areola. And the areola is really neat because in women who have been pregnant, the melanin actually darkens. So women who have given birth or have been pregnant tend to have darker areolas. And the reason why I like to bring that up is to tie something to uh, a chapter that my a one students looked at at the very end of the semester, and that is eyesight. So when we think about form follows function, why in the world does that happen in a pregnant woman's body? Well, let's think about babies. When babies are born, their cones are not as developed. Recall that cones are responsible for your color, sharp acuity vision. They're mostly using their rods, which we use for contrasting. Um, when we're driving at night, we're mostly using our rods. And so babies can really only detect contrasting colors. Well, let's think about this. Where is a baby's food source? What did mama's body do while baby was developing? Made the food source contrast. Incredible, right? I just love talking about that. It's just so incredible to me that the woman's body will do these things automatically in response to the, to the little life that's inside of her. So that's the mammary gland. That's related to breastfeeding. And one reason why we promote breastfeeding so much, if a woman is willing and able to, is because milk contains lots of proteins, fats, lactose, a lot of immunological um, benefits for the baby to breastfeed as well. Um, 
But there you have it, really important female organ. All right, there you have it, the basics of the female reproductive system. Let me know in the comments what you think, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.